good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming to live worship this morning, and it is really good to see you. Our scripture is from 1 Peter 5. This is our last weekend in this series, and then we're going to go uh, next, starting next week into a, a few weeks specifically on prayer itself, but for today we're in 1 Peter 5. So would you stand with me as we read God's word together and look and see what this end of the letter has to say to us this morning. Here's what the scripture says. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a seat. Well, the other day, uh, Deborah and I went uh, after church, actually a couple weeks ago, to see the Pompeii uh, exhibit at the Museum, was it, Museum of Natural Sciences, Natural History and Sciences. And uh, we uh, grabbed lunch right of church and went over to see it, uh, took my in-laws with us because they like that sort of thing. And uh, I have never been uh, to Pompeii. Uh, everything I know has been through the documentaries and books and things that you read. So it was the first time I'd ever seen uh, actual artifacts from, from that uh, eruption. If you remember 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius uh, erupts just unbelievably uh, in a catastrophic way. And Pompeii, a city of 11,000 people, just at the base of the volcano, absolutely destroyed and buried under an unbelievable amount of just ash and earth and rock. So while I was uh, looking at her, just going through, what was amazing, just, just first thing you notice is the exquisite detail with which uh, these artifacts are preserved. When you see the, the, the pots and the vases and the thing, the detail, the painting, the etching, it's just all there. It's like it was being used uh, yesterday. And it was just absolutely incredible to see. And it dawned on me as I was walking through, so this happens. Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. And our letter, First Peter, ballpark, is written within about 20, 25 years of Mount Vesuvius's eruption. So although slightly different places, this letter is written to sort of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Uh, you know, Pompeii is on the western side uh, of the Italian coast. But time period-wise, they're similar. And so the Roman Empire that Peter is writing to and the church is trying to get established in it would have been very much comparable in both places, in the sense that the culture, uh, the way things were happening, uh, you know, when you look at Pompeii, you're seeing almost the uh, same time period, just in a different spot, First Peter. And, and what would amaze us, and what amazes me, is how similar, in some ways, that culture was to ours. Uh, for example, in Pompeii, you could go to a restaurant, and you had an option, uh, so that you could either dine in, and eat uh, there, but they also had a to-go counter so that you could grab it and then return to your residence. So if you want to know where HEB got the idea for curbside, it happened in Pompeii. The Roman Empire is where it all started. Uh, they also had some practices, though, that were very foreign to us. Uh, one of my favorite spots, I was, I was laughing at Courtney's uh, children's moment when she put up that uh, Better Homes and Garden cookbook. I think that's, that's the first cookbook I ever had. I remember my mom using that to, uh, to nobody's end. I think we've been through three or four in, in our house just because all the pages end up sticking together. But uh, uh, they, they had a kitchen section, and they had uh, one uh, vase that was sort of, uh, had a very small lid, uh, but holes poked in it so that air could get in. And apparently in the Roman culture of the time, there was a certain kind of rat that was a delicacy. And so they would keep the live rats in the jar, and then they would reach in, pull them out, and grill them as a delicacy of the day. Anybody want that for lunch? Probably not. But, you know, this is the culture. Uh, very diverse. Uh, all sorts of religions, people who knew 
the, the Ten Commandments because they had Jewish roots, people who did not. Uh, you had cults that were uh, worshiping Caesar, Greek and Roman gods, uh, all sorts of things. And it's into this sort of almost religious chaos, you might say, uh, that Peter is writing to the church. So I want to focus on him just a minute. Now we said before, you may remember that that 1 Peter is probably not written by the disciple Peter directly uh, because the reason we think is the Greek that's used is just is highly polished. However, if you read chapter 5 all the way through, uh, you'll come across the name of a guy named Silvanus, and uh, uh, that's his Greek name. And it says that Peter is writing this with him. So some people think that's the scribe, and as Peter talks, Silvanus is writing the letter. So it's not as if Peter wrote it directly, but he's looking just over the shoulder. And as he talks to us, he's trying to describe for us how to be leaders in this thing called the church. But I want to I focus on him just a little bit more, if you indulge me for a second. I think we've got a picture, Rembrandt's uh, picture of him. This is called Peter's uh, Confessional. Uh, Rembrandt did kind of two paintings, which I think were probably designed to be side by side. Uh, he did one where Peter denies Christ. And if you've been to Vacation Bible School, you remember that story. Jesus is literally dying on the cross. Peter is asked, do you know him? Aren't you a Galilean? He denies Jesus three times. It's the low point of Peter's uh, probably life as a disciple following uh, Jesus. But if you remember our scripture that we just read a moment ago, one of the lines that Peter says is, I a witness to Christ's suffering. He would have seen this. He didn't just hear that Jesus died. He saw it. He was, he was there. And as he saw it, as Christ was asking him to step up and say, yes, I was with him. Peter said no. But in the painting that we have here, this is Peter's repentance, and one of the things you might notice in it is just off to the side on the ground are keys, which are always, not always, but frequently in art, symbols that this is indeed Peter because he holds the keys uh, to the kingdom that Christ has given him. But what I like about this uh, picture is he doesn't have them in his hands. In other words, he's repenting. He is saying, Lord, I have let you down. I have failed you. Forgive me. But what Jesus, I think, is on the verge of doing, or the Holy Spirit is on the verge of doing in this painting, is the mission is still there. The keys are still there. The things that Jesus wants Peter to do and to be about are still there. Even though he's messed it up, they're still there. And so once he confesses and asks, Lord, make me new again, then all of a sudden he can pick those up and go forward in the mission that Christ has in mind for him. Why is that important for us to talk today? As we come to this table, you and I have the same chance. We can confess our sin. We can say, this is where I have fallen short. This is where, <laughs> Jesus, you spoke in my name and I let you down. But what we'll find here is that the mission is still before us. There's something that Jesus is going to ask you and I after we spend a few minutes here at his table and say, pick this back up and let's go forward and let's do more and let's continue to remember who we are as the church, the body of Christ, so that we can change this world and make it better. Now, I'll tell you, it's not easy. The chief image that's used in this scripture passage is one of being a shepherd. And as you all well know, we most frequently think about shepherd as being the leader of a flock of sheep. I've got a picture of some sheep here, I think, if we could put that up. That's who we're leading here. And that's not necessarily us. We're not talking about you all. We could. But I think in this passage, Peter's us thinking about leading the world. And the world is like a bunch of sheep. And they don't know where they need to go. Amen? Amen. The world's nuts. Isn't it? It's just crazy sometimes. When we, when we look on uh, social media, I'm always amazed at where are all these people who have all this time to write these scathing negative things everywhere. This is sick. 
The world is threatened in some ways. <laughs> you know, it seems like, like never before. I was talking to uh, somebody in uh, HISD, and HISD right now has 15,000 kids that have some kind of COVID exposure. Oh my goodness, the pressure that that puts on our education system. I've got, uh, you know, it's, uh, people in our congregation, our teachers and principals, and trying to find enough people to get the jobs done. There are not enough districts, or in some districts, there are not enough bus drivers that they can't find just to drive the buses to get the kids to school. This is a mess. Amanda mentioned in, in its, you know, our announcements, uh, Afghanistan and refugees and, that are coming. It's like, oh my goodness, they're coming literally with the clothes on their back, escaping one of the most violent places on planet Earth, and yet many of them, it looks like, are going to land in some way and somehow in Houston. What are we going to do? That's an amazing challenge to bring people in across the world and say, here is a new home, and then help them with everything that they're going to need. I've met some of these folks, not from Afghanistan, but in years past, who were coming to us from Iraq. And I would go in the tennis courts, just over here at the apartment complex, and meet these families, and I would say through an interpreter, how long have you been here in Houston, the United States? And they would say, two or three weeks. And I'd look at them and I'd say, again, through an interpreter, what do you need? What can we do to help? And they said, we need everything. Now, remember... Peter is writing this letter to leaders of the church. And I've got to confess to you, sometimes it just feels like it's never going to end, doesn't it? I mean, the challenges we face at home, the challenges we face at school, the challenges that we face with you know, things that are going on in the world, all of which seem to be happening in our backyard. Sometimes I just look up at heaven in frustration and somewhat pray but somewhat complain and say, Lord, when is this going to end? And you know what the answer is? When he comes back, when he comes back, as our scripture says, we endure this. We lead through this. We represent Christ through the trials that are to come. So that when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, we will be given a crown of glory that lasts forever. The trials of this world will cease. Paradise will be restored. And you and I will have a conversation with our Lord about how faithful we have been. It's funny, it's uh, during this First Peter series, it's a, I've, I've hosted uh, online through Zoom uh, a Bible study on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. It's an either or, not a both and. But uh, for five weeks now, uh, a group of us, 20 to 25 between the two, uh, have talked First Peter. And one of the things that we've discussed has been, again, this is a letter written to leaders. And so today as we meet for the last time, and it was Wednesday we meet for the last time, I told them, I said, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, this is a letter written to leaders, and so it should change us. And so I'm interested, what, is, what do you think Christ is asking you to lead, to make happen, to be an instrument so that something happens because of you? What is that that Christ is asking you to be about as we end this letter together? I had coffee with one of our participants this week at uh, the Toot Sweet coffee shop in Edo. And uh, I said, what else is going on? We were just chatting. And he said, well, I've been thinking about the question that you asked. Like, what needs to happen because of me? And I said, I said well, tell me what you're thinking. He said, it scares me. And I don't have an answer yet. And I told him as we talked, I said, keep praying. But here's the thing, you need one. Jesus gives none of us the luxury of just being a spectator. It's true. He calls all of us to have a role, a part, a piece that we play in his kingdom. And so, you know, as you and I, as we pray today, as we gather at the table today, as we feel Christ and the Holy Spirit move through us, there's two things that should be going on. One is we're simply grateful, <laughs> we're repentant, we thank Jesus for the relationship that we have with God our maker through him and all that that makes possible. But we also understand our responsibility in the sense that you and I are to be about the building of a kingdom and each of us has a role there. 
sometimes people will come to me and they say, uh, Pastor, Amanda, you've probably heard this a time or two. Uh, they'll say, I'll come to you and they say, just ask me to do anything. Anything you ask me to do, I'll do. I understand that. I appreciate it. And I've used that from time to time, especially when really you know, things that appear to me to be important need to get done. But ultimately, it's not up to your pastor to ask you to lead something. And when you and Jesus are having your conversation, as I will have mine and Amanda will have hers too, Jesus is not going to ask you, did you do everything your pastor told you to do or asked you to do? That's not how it works. But what he will say is, what have you had a conversation with me? What, have, what has the Lord asked you to do? And it's therein, I think we can find the beginnings of what it is to be faithful. You know, as I think about this letter of 1 Peter, again, thinking about him as a man, he was part of some of the greatest moments that we read about in the Gospels. Who is it that you say that I am, Jesus asked. And after a variety of answers from disciples who had been with Jesus just as long as Peter had, but were wrong, it's Peter who says, you are the Messiah. You are the one who is to come. And then Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Peter, for my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. As referenced a moment ago, though, he was also part of some of the most painful and lowest moments of Jesus' ministry. In that the very hour that Jesus is on the cross, Peter doesn't show up, nor do any of the others. It's complete abandonment of our Lord. But yet in Peter, what we have here, I think, is the whole human spectrum. There are glorious moments that we have in our life in following Jesus Christ. And there are moments, because we are sinful and broken, that we let him down. And what you and I are called to do is knowing those extremes to bring this life together so that we leave sin behind. We leave faithlessness behind. And what we do is pick up the new life, the new opportunity that we are given. You know, as First Peter writes this letter, he gives us some other examples as leaders in the church. One of the things he says in chapter 5 is don't lord it over people. If you're somebody who's leading a ministry, if you've got something, you know, that you're in charge of, you're somebody who makes happen, he says don't get arrogant about it, okay? But be humble and stay humble so that when people look at you, what they see is the example of Jesus Christ. So Peter, as he talks to us through this scribe, is not only giving us, you know, sort of uh, 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 an indication of our responsibility, but he's telling us how to do it. To be humble, to be a servant, to go about your work. One of my favorite phrases in the letter was from last week in chapter 4. And it says, when the Lord asks you to be hospitable, don't grumble about it. You know, sometimes I'm amazed that even though this, this letter was written over 2,000 years ago, it's still applicable. There have been times when people have asked me to do something, and I've done it. But I've grumbled. You know, my wife was leaving uh, for work the other day, and, and she has a habit. She, uh, she likes post-it notes more than life itself. And so every time she leaves, she'll come, she'll come, she'll give me a hug, she'll give me a kiss on the cheek, and then she hands me my post-it note of things that I'm supposed to get done that day. And there are days that I've done them as a humble servant, and there are days that I've grumbled about it. But Peter gives us a direction. We've got to let the grumbling go. We have to embrace the humility that Christ not only calls for, but models for us. And then in our heart of hearts, there has to be a place where we are not only intimately connected to Christ, but what is it that we're picking up and doing as Jesus has given us a portion of the keys to his kingdom? Maybe we're being a champion for a teacher that could really use one right now. Maybe we're preparing our hearts to welcome people to our city who are going to need a lot of help as they come and be residents and neighbors of ours. Maybe it's time to take a look at a new challenge. I was talking to somebody who has just become an empty nester. Their kids are now in college, and now they're kind of saying, what comes next? Maybe you're there. Say, what's that next step of faith that Jesus is asking me to take? I don't know what the answer is for you, but as we go into a time of prayer and discernment, as we've just begun a year 
of prayer. As we uh, prepare for the 26th, we will gather as a church to pray for God's will and discernment for us. I don't know what the Lord is going to say to you, but I know that there's an answer and a direction that God has in mind for each and every one of us. And it is absolutely crucial that we find it. Because when the chief shepherd does come back, we don't want to be found wanting. We can't say to Jesus, I never found my spot. We can't say to Jesus, you called me, but I didn't answer. We can't say to Jesus, well, I was so busy, I didn't have enough time. When the day comes, there has to be something to say. If you go see the Pompeii exhibit, or even just look at the pictures online, you'll see some, some rather shocking, uh, maybe what's the right even word, gruesome evidence of this. In addition to the artifacts, as you know, uh, the pottery, uh, the keys, uh, the cookware, uh, the statues, the artwork, in addition to all that in the Pompeii exhibit, one of the things they also have are the molds left behind of the victims of the volcano as they perished. And some of them are just uh, ghastly. Uh, you can still see the robes, uh, the imprint of the robes and clothes. You can still see the patterns uh, that they had uh, on their collar or sash. You can also see the expression on their faces, which in most cases are gruesome, horrible to see. I think perhaps the most painful one that I saw is that there was, uh, it looked like a, a family, maybe uh, friends, who knows. Uh, but they were, they were looked like they had been running and, and they had covered or holding over their head, looked like a tile or shingle of some kind that presumably they were holding up there just as, as the lava and the ash and the rock just rained down upon them. And I just can't imagine what they're even thinking as this goes on, the horror, the absolute horror horror of it all but that would be their last day as it would be for the whole city and, and here's the thing you and I know a day is coming we don't know when it is but Peter references it there's going to be a day where the good shepherd comes back and when that day comes there's going to be a conversation and really what the church is, and I think scripture is in so many ways, is God's effort for us to be prepared with an answer. That in Christ, we have put our faith. In Jesus, we have put our trust. And in response to that, we have given every aspect of our life to him and to his glory. The specifics of how we do that will change as seasons change in life. The ministries and things that we are a part of, they will change as, as Christ calls us in a variety of ways. But yet, our answer has to be there and we have to be able, to, I think, to look Jesus in the eye and say, here is how I have responded to what you are calling me and your church to do. So I would encourage us, especially in this year of prayer, to find an answer to that question or to find it again. Because none of us are going to be perfect each of us will be in the position of Peter that we saw. But the promise that Christ makes us is, is that once we have asked for forgiveness, once we have knelt before him and say, Lord, work through me, forgive me, work through me again, Jesus says that he will. And there'll be a set of keys right by our side. And the question will be, are you and I ready to pick them up? Pray with me. Lord, we thank you. For your never-ending love and grace. You truly are the good shepherd. <laughs> you watch over us. You correct us. You keep us on track. And for that, Lord, we are grateful. We lift up today to you uh, a few things, Jesus. <laughs> One is just ourselves. We pray that you would give us peace. Help us to find the joy and love that only comes from you. We pray for our families and our friends. We ask, Lord, that as we uh, worship with those we love today, that you would rekindle within us, just remind us of what a gift each and every one of us are. We also pray for our world, O oh Lord, that is hurting. And so we ask that you would hear the voices that are calling upon you even now. 
And we place ourselves at your disposal, Jesus, so that we might be instruments who answer those prayers. Simply speak your word to us, and we will go. All of this and more, Jesus, we pray in your holy name. And as God's people, the church, we say together, amen. As I mentioned, uh, we have a, a year of prayer that is before us. And one of the things we're going to do uh, over the course of the year is just kind of explore ways in which we pray. Uh, because one of the, the pieces of feedback uh, that we've gotten is just a lot of, a lot of y'all have just kind of very openly and honestly said, it's like, I just, I'm just really not sure I know how to pray. I said, well, let's talk about that. So uh, we have a prayer of confession that we're going to use to start our time together around the Lord's table. So if you would, let's put that up on the screen. And then could we, as the church, pray this prayer together? Pray with me. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. One evening, Jesus gathered his disciples to worship together, to remember what God had done through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses, through Rebecca, and Sarah, through the prophets, through the judges, so many people called to help God's people stay faithful. As they chaired that time together, and they would have prayed and they would have sang, but there came a moment in the evening where Jesus did this. He took bread and he blessed it to his father and then he broke it and he said, take and eat all of you. This is my body that's broken for you. Do this when you gather in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took a cup that was filled with wine. He lifted it up to the Lord and he blessed it. And he looked around at the same disciples and said to them this, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as you gather in the future and drink of it in remembrance of me. So we as the church are gathered today in this same place, remembering Christ's same words, reminding us who he is, who we are, and who Jesus is calling each of us to be. So I'd invite you to, to remember that in our church, communion is open to anyone who wants to receive it. Everybody is welcome who seeks a relationship with Jesus Christ. I would invite you to take the canisters, which you should have received. If you need one, just raise your hand. And I'm sure one of our ushers will come and bring it to you. Uh, we are celebrating communion this way to keep everybody as safe as we possibly can. But I would invite you to open it, and there should be a wafer. And then a second layer, uh, the juice. So if you would have that ready. The body of Christ that is broken for us. The blood of Christ that is shed for us. Take and eat, take and drink in remembrance of him. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this gift of bread and wine. We pray that they would come for us, the body and blood of Christ so that we might be the body of Christ for the world. Jesus, we are forgiven by you. We are redeemed by you. We are made new by you. May all these promises of the gospel come alive in us so that we might be the witnesses that you need in this world at this time as we act in your name. All this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord and as God's people we say together, amen. It is a tradition in our church to sing the Lord's Prayer after celebrating the sacrament together. So I'd invite you to stand. And if you are comfortable, feel free to grab the hand of those next to you as we sing together the words our Savior taught us as we pray. 